He was past being overweight. He was morbidly obese. I just kept on eating just to satisfy that sensation I had. Things just kind of snowballed out of control. It was critical. She looked like someone had poured hot oil on her. I was horrified. She was unrecognizable. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. When 10-month-old Julie McCauley comes down with a case of the chicken pox, her mother is sure it'll pass. But within just two days, her entire body is infested with mysterious, life-threatening blisters. I was watching my daughter die in front of my eyes. I had nothing else to do but pray that somehow, some way, she would be saved. Then, for the first few years of his life, Connor Hayback's parents could barely get him to eat. But by the time he turns 12, he's gaining weight at a terrifying rate and eating anything he can get his hands on. How humiliating is that, that you're so hungry that you're going through garbage cans? We were scared, but we were panicking. I felt helpless. In 1991, 35-year-old Jean McCauley was single and living in Denver, Colorado, where she managed a travel agency. And to those who knew her well, she had earned a reputation as a workaholic. I didn't have any time for any kind of social life. I would go in at 7 in the morning and sometimes work until 11 o'clock at night. And there was no time to, to meet anybody, so I didn't really date. But soon after her 35th birthday, she meets a man and falls in love. I finally did get into a relationship, but it didn't really work out. And at the end of that relationship, I was very surprised to find out on New Year's Eve that I thought I had the flu, and the doctor told me, congratulations, you're going to have a baby. I was very excited and happy to be pregnant. That was something I had dreamed about, so I made a decision to have my baby by myself. Our family is so close and supportive that I didn't think there'd be a problem with it. We're always right there to help out with each other. Julie was born on September 2nd, 1993, and she was a very healthy, perfect baby. She was just the most beautiful baby I had ever seen. I would love to have been home with her from the time she was a newborn, but I had to go to work. It was hard for me. I didn't want to leave her. My mother babysat her for me. Jean is great at being a mother. She can really tackle anything. For the first nine months, Jean is blissfully happy as her healthy baby hits one milestone after another. Julie was crawling at the right time. She was talking. She was doing very, very well. She was doing everything that every normal baby would do. But shortly after Julie turns 10 months old, something happens to the little girl. Something terrifying. I was getting ready for work one morning and I took a shower and I came out and Julie's back was to me and she was completely stiff and she was white her eyes were wide open and her mouth was wide open I just didn't know what had happened to her I called an ambulance and I was terrified within minutes the paramedics arrived they find the infant's vital signs normal, but Julie is completely frozen. Then, without warning, she snaps out of it. She stopped the stiffness and began to shake. They transported her to a hospital. She was seen by doctors and given a CAT scan to make sure that she didn't have a brain tumor or a bleed in her brain. I was scared to death. But the CAT scan images don't reveal anything out of the ordinary. They showed no abnormalities in her brain, no bleeds, no tumors. They told me that she had had a grand mal seizure. In a grand mal seizure, an individual loses consciousness and their muscles contract both violently and involuntarily. It was a quite a shock and a surprise to us. We never heard of anyone in the family ever having a seizure. The doctors told me at that point that may have been the only one she would ever have. I thought, she's going to be okay. But just two weeks later, there's another frightening incident. 
I was getting ready for work again, and sure enough, she was having another seizure. The seizures were terrifying. I took Julie in to the pediatrician, and they told me that now this would be a diagnosis of pediatric epilepsy. Pediatric epilepsy is a neurological disorder afflicting children in which unusual electrical activity in the brain triggers grand mal seizures. The doctors told me that some children just have seizures with no known cause. I was told that they would give her some medication that would help control the seizures. I had to give Julie three pills every morning and three pills every night. For two weeks, everything was great. But just when she thinks she has things under control, Jean notices something wrong with one of Julie's eyes. Her right eye was getting puffy and that the lid was swollen. My mother said she thought that maybe she was having some kind of an allergic reaction to something. By the time I came home from work that night, her other eye was now swollen. She could barely open her eyes. I checked her temperature and she was 101 and she was very agitated. I called the pediatrician's office first thing in the morning and made an appointment to bring Julie in to be seen by the doctor. The physician starts by performing a thorough physical exam. She looked inside of her ear and she said she has something in her ear. It looks like a little fluid filled blister and it's probably an ear infection and the fact that her eyes were swollen shut she also said that she looked like she had conjunctivitis in both eyes and so she prescribed an antibiotic for the ear infection and she said to continue to give her her seizure medicine I was upset that she was so sick she told me she'll be doing much better in three or four days but within hours of bringing her daughter home, a shocking new symptom stops Jean dead in her tracks. I looked down at Julie's shoulder and there were about three blisters on the back of her shoulder. They were fluid filled and they were pretty big, like the size of a pencil eraser. I didn't know what it could possibly be. She was just very sick and I was scared. After suffering two seizures, 10-month-old Julie McCauley has been put on anti-convulsant medication. But now, she's experiencing a slew of bizarre, seemingly unrelated symptoms. Her eyes are swollen shut with conjunctivitis. Her ear is infected. And now she's developed strange blisters on her back. I was very concerned because she had so many things going on at the same time. I immediately took her straight to the doctor. But following a careful exam, the doctor is confident she knows what's wrong with Julie. In addition to having conjunctivitis and an ear infection, she now has chickenpox. Chickenpox is a viral childhood disease characterized by flu-like symptoms and spots that look like blisters. At that point, now we had a diagnosis knowing what was going on. The pediatrician explained to me that she will probably get more and more crops of these blisters they'll come in in over a period of days and then they'll go away just as the doctor predicted over the next 24 hours julie develops a high fever grows reluctant to eat or drink and the blisters begin to spread she now had um blisters on on different parts of her body and they were scattered there were um, some on her arms there were some on her face and on her lips on her mouth she was not taking her bottle she wasn't swallowing and she wasn't taking anything by mouth she still continued to run a fever that ran about 103 degrees i was completely distraught i decided i'm taking her to the, the emergency room the doctor gave her an examination and she said yes she definitely has the chicken pox and they were pretty severe she had a really bad case they started on IV fluids to hydrate her, and they said, we need to make sure that she gets her anti-seizure medication. And so they started an IV. Julie is admitted to the hospital, but the doctors assure Jean that there's no cause for alarm. The chicken pox will simply have to run its course.
The doctors told me that I could stay with her. I would check her a lot during the night. I could literally see the, the blisters forming on her body. This little red spot would go to a big fat splotch and then it would raise up. They would go from the size of a nickel to quarter size. It was the strangest thing I had ever seen in my life. I was just overwhelmed with all of the things that were going on at one time. She now had blisters across her chest, on her arms, on her back, on her legs. I came to visit in the hospital. She had changed almost overnight. She was so totally blistered. I was horrified. I kept asking, is this normal for chicken pox? I've never seen chicken pox like this. And I was always told, yes, not to worry. She's going to get better. It's going to turn around. She'll be OK. But Julie's blisters continue to multiply at a horrifying rate. Now the blisters were starting to run together. Her whole face was now a giant mass. I had never seen blisters that large in my life. She was unrecognizable. She looked like someone had poured hot oil on her. She looked like she had been burned. I would have loved to have picked her up and held her, but at that point, any time you touched her, she cried. And so all I could do was stand there. I knew in, at that point that in my heart, this was not the chicken pox. Something else was wrong. Something was terribly wrong, but I did not know what it was. Terrified and desperate to save her child, Jean begs the doctors to reconsider their diagnosis. Nobody ordered any other tests. They just said that it's chicken pox. I was watching my daughter die in front of my eyes, and nobody was taking me seriously. I said over and over, it can't possibly be chicken pox. Something more is happening here, and no one will listen. I would have given anything, anything, my last breath on this earth, for it to have been me and not her. Now, Lois Tyler, a nurse, has been assigned to Julie's case. And nothing could have prepared the 27-year veteran for the state her new patient is in. She had blisters all over, and the size was much bigger than the typical chicken pox. Some of them were four, five, and six inches in size. Typical chicken pox lesion is a little red bump about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. I felt like Lois was the only hope that we had. She talked like one mother to another, and she was very concerned about Julie. I did not think that Julie had chicken pox. In fact, Lois has seen one other case just like Julie's, in a child ultimately diagnosed with a rare and often fatal condition. I felt strongly that somebody needed to pay attention and change some orders and have somebody else take a look at her. I went out to the desk and found the physician caring for her and told him what I thought. The doctor said that they would discuss it amongst themselves. Not long afterwards, pediatric dermatologist Dr. Bernard Cohen takes over the case, and he agrees that the symptoms go way beyond chickenpox. If you have an individual with a blistering eruption and they've started an anticonvulsant in the preceding three weeks, then I'm going to have a very high index of suspicion that they're having a drug reaction. Once you look carefully at the clinical findings, there really is almost nothing else that can do this. Julie was diagnosed with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Stevens-Johnson syndrome is an autoimmune disorder in which the body experiences a severe reaction to certain medications. In healthy individuals, white blood cells defend the body by attacking infections and foreign substances. But in patients like Julie, a medication reprograms the white blood cells to target the mucous membranes and skin. As the top layer of skin starts to die, blisters form. Steven Johnson syndrome can be triggered by any number of medications. In Julie's case, the anticonvulsant was the trigger. When I found out that all this time this was a drug reaction, I was very upset and I was angry that I wasn't warned. I never in a million years would I have dreamed that someone 
could react to medication so violently. In fact, all of Julie's symptoms have been a reaction to the epilepsy medication she was given almost three weeks earlier. Just days after starting the drug, her white blood cells attacked her eyes. Julie's eyes were swollen shut because she had blisters forming on the inside of her eyelids and the white part of her eye. Blisters form because there is an injury to the cells of the bottom of the epidermis. And if you injure enough of these cells, if you kill these cells, the skin, the epidermis separates from the dermis. And if that separation is big enough, you're going to see clinically a blister. At the same time, she suffered blistering in her mouth and throat, making it almost impossible to swallow liquids and causing her to become dehydrated. This was actually quite painful. It makes it extremely difficult to swallow. As the blisters continued to spread, Julie's condition worsened. When you kill cells on the skin, they release chemicals that trigger fever. The job of the epidermis is to protect you from bacterial infections. It is the part of your body and your skin that interacts with the outside world. So without it, you can't survive. And that's why Stevens Johnson syndrome is so devastating, because the injury is full thickness. So you get total dysfunction of the epidermis. Although Jean is horrified at how far her daughter's disease has been allowed to progress, she's relieved to finally have a correct diagnosis. I thought, thank God, now we know she's going to get better. They're going to get her better now. But then he said, this is life-threatening. There's a very good possibility that she will not make it. Julie's life was seriously in danger at this point. Without your skin, you won't survive. Jean was hysterical and at the end of her robe and leaned on to Julie and looked up to the sky and screamed, God, please don't take my baby. The thought of losing her was something I did not want to ever think about. I couldn't say goodbye. I wouldn't say goodbye to her. Jean McCauley has just been told that her 11-month-old daughter, Julie, is suffering from Stevens-Johnson syndrome, an extremely rare disease triggered by a medication she's been taking for epilepsy. It's caused a horrific reaction, leaving more than 80% of her body covered in potentially life-threatening blisters. The biggest risk of death is from secondary infection. If you have widespread areas of your mucous membranes and your skin ulcerated and open, those are all routes of entry for bacteria. Unfortunately, there is no specific treatment. There's nothing that we know that stops the course of the disease. So once it gets going, it tends to run its course to completion. The first thing the medical team must do is take Julie off the anticonvulsant medication. There were some sedative-like medications that can suppress seizures, and then we needed to provide the best supportive care possible and make sure that she was watched carefully for any signs of secondary infection. They treated her just like a burn patient. She was wrapped and bandaged from head to toe. I had nothing else to do uh, but but pray that she was going to be okay and that somehow, some way, she will be saved. The medical team does all they can to ward off any life-threatening infections. But despite their efforts, Julie takes a sudden turn for the worse. One day, things went downhill really, really quickly. Julie spiked a temperature, and the temperature kept going up. And she was coughing a lot, and you could tell she was having trouble breathing. And then her breathing sounded very loud and raspy and gurgly, and there was something wrong. Something was going terribly wrong. I called a pediatrician, and they ordered a portable chest x-ray to come up. And when they looked, Julie's lungs were collapsing from so much sloughing. Essentially, the inside of Julie's lungs are covered in blisters, and the skin is peeling off. At this point, her oxygen level was going down, and she had to be on oxygen. Unfortunately, sometimes when we make the diagnosis of Stephen Johnson syndrome, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. The skin lesions, the, the rash and the erosions and the blisters in the mouth and in the skin and the eyes may go on to progress for any number of days, maybe up to a couple weeks. Some patients will develop respiratory distress syndrome. 
and that's certainly another potential cause of serious complications and death in patients like Julie. They thought that perhaps she was not going to make it through that night, and it was a horrible night. My sister stayed with me the entire night, and she never left my, my side or Julie's side, and she was there with me because she was afraid then also that Julie was going to die and that I was going to be there by myself when it happened and she wasn't going to leave me. I remember screaming and crying and by then my emotions were out of control. I was devastated. I'm watching my daughter slip away from something so simple as a pill to make her better and have no warning. In a desperate attempt to keep Julie breathing, doctors insert an apparatus into Julie's lungs and suction out the dead tissue. The nurse came in and she suctioned her every 15 minutes and it, it was horrible to see and it was horrible for Julie because she would choke and, and struggle against it, but her breathing got better. Next, doctors need to address the issue of Julie's eyes, which have been swollen shut for days. Scarring is relatively unusual, but one of the areas where it can be quite devastating is, is on the eyes. And scarring on the eyes, particularly the cornea, can result in permanent visual loss. They told me that they were doing everything they could to try to save her eyes, but that they wouldn't know for a couple of months. I started crying. It was the most devastating thing to hear. For the next two weeks, Julie is monitored 24 hours a day until finally she begins to turn the corner. Her fever broke and she was running a normal temperature. Nobody knows why, but apparently Stevens-Johnson syndrome, it had finished. The immune system, which had been turned on by the whole process in the first place, was settling down and getting back to normal. We knew then that the worst was now over. It was a tremendous relief. As grateful as she is that her daughter has survived the ordeal, Jean can't help but wonder why so many mistakes were made along the way. I was angry. I wanted to know why the doctors didn't diagnose Julie correctly in the very beginning. Stephen Johnson syndrome is clearly rare and some estimates place it at three to six per million patients. This disorder early on in its course can masquerade as any number of common things like chicken pox. Unfortunately, people don't always think outside the box. It took someone to challenge the diagnosis that she carried before people started to think outside the box. I am a firm believer in being a patient advocate, and if something needs to be said to make the patient better, I will do that. If Julie hadn't been diagnosed and the trigger hadn't been identified, she certainly was at risk for death. It's now all too clear how lucky they were to meet Lois when they did. But the disease has taken its toll on Julie. The blisters have permanently damaged her eyes. She's blind in her right eye, and her left eye has low vision and an extreme sensitivity to light. But as Julie slowly recovers over the next year, there is an unexpected and pleasant surprise. Fortunately for Julie, she was cured of her epilepsy. The cause of Julie's seizures was unknown. The last seizure she had, she was 15 months old. Today, Julie is 16 years old and has no memory of the horrifying ordeal she and her mother endured. Today, Julie is a teenager. She is a very normal, well-rounded teenage girl doing all the things that other teenage girls do. My hopes for my future are that I could go to college and major in music. I want to have some sort of career in the music field. I'm not sure what yet, but definitely involving singing. She proved to us as a baby that she's a fighter. She's made it this far, and she's going to keep going. She'll be everything she's ever wanted to be. I think what makes me so strong is that I have all the support from my family, which really helps me. I would like to say thank you to my mom for fighting so hard for me because if it wasn't for her fighting for me, I don't think I would have been here today. While Jean McCauley saw her daughter go from perfect health to the brink of death practically overnight, Connor Hayback's parents watched in horror as their son's disease slowly took over his life. In August of 1966, 
John Hayback and Sue Conley were carefree teenagers living in the suburbs of Chicago. I went to an all-boys Catholic high school. She went to an all-girls Catholic high school with my sister. My sister encouraged me to ask her out, and I did. There was definitely just a, a real attraction from the moment I met him. They dated all through high school, and three years after starting college, John and Sue got married. By the time John had his degree in neuroscience and Sue completed her studies in special education, the young couple was finally ready to fulfill a cherished dream. We always wanted to have children. It was more important than really anything else to, to have a family. I'm one of nine children. John's one of six children. We had thoughts of having at least four or five children. Their first child is a healthy girl they name Micheline. And almost as soon as she's out of diapers, Sue is pregnant again. We're a lot more relaxed about the birth and delivery leading up to it. We felt like we were prepared and knew what to expect. I've been blessed with easy pregnancies. I um, didn't have any problems. Connor was born on August 7th, 1980. He weighed just under seven pounds. At first, Connor seems healthy, but as soon as Sue tries to feed him, she notices something odd. He tried to nurse, and he could a little bit, but it wasn't uh, an efficient suck. He would suck for a few seconds, then stop. He'd be exhausted. I was puzzled as to why he wasn't able to nurse effectively. The doctor told us that he had hypotonia, which is very low muscle tone. Hypotonia is a condition that results in muscle weakness and can be triggered by a variety of issues, including genetic, muscle, or central nervous system disorders. The muscles in the mouth and the tongue were working. I had just delivered a baby, and then you're told that your child is sick. It's very confusing. The doctor had said, for babies like this, you need to start a regimen of physical therapy. And while the doctor can't seem to pinpoint the exact source of the hypotonia, he's confident that Connor will respond to treatment. So we went home and started therapy for him. But after several weeks of rigorous treatment, Connor continues to have trouble eating. It was very difficult to get enough food into him. He didn't gain any weight for the first month. He stayed six pounds, which is really unusual. So, of course, we worried. So I ended up going to the pediatrician. At two and a half months, she said, why don't we try giving him solid foods? It's a little early for solid foods, but in this situation, let's go for it. Solid food's a lot easier to get in than liquid food, so he could eat a lot better, and he started to gain weight. Over the next 10 months, Connor seems to be back on track. But then, without any warning, an alarming new symptom begins to emerge. He would try and talk a lot, but it would be very, very difficult to understand him. It was hard for him to articulate. He just had great difficulty forming syllables. Concerned, John and Sue take Connor back to the pediatrician, who explains that Connor's speech problems are yet another result of his hypotonia. Just as the sucking was more difficult, producing sound is the same musculature was difficult. The pediatrician recommended speech therapy. Our attitude with Connor was that whatever he needs to develop to optimize his potential, we're going to do. Over the next few years, Connor's speech gradually improves, although he never overcomes the hypotonia completely. There was still some ongoing therapy going on, especially in speech. He loved therapy. He liked the one-on-one -on -one attention. By the time he's ready to start kindergarten, Connor's speech problems are relatively minor. And even his lifelong eating problem seems to have abruptly disappeared. In fact, now the five-year-old loves to eat. Kind of went from being skinny to all of a sudden he got to be a little, on a little pudgy. Both of our genetic backgrounds, we have people in our families who are a little bit overweight, so it wasn't a big concern. Throughout elementary school, Connor is the chubbiest kid in his class. But John and Sue aren't concerned because he's doing so well otherwise. Academically, Connor always performed well. He loved school, he loves his teachers, he's very social. School was always a happy place for him. But shortly after Connor turns 12, his parents begin to notice a disturbing change. Their son is gaining weight fast, very fast. At his annual checkup, the doctor is taken aback when Connor steps on the scale. At four foot eight, he weighs 150 pounds. She was anticipating that he would hit puberty and that he would grow four or five inches and that he would get taller and leaner. But over the next year, the haybacks grow more and more worried, and it soon becomes clear that Connor is putting on weight much faster than he's growing. 
it just became very concerning that he was gaining so rapidly and without any real obvious difference in the way he was eating at home. We ate, you know, a generally healthy diet. He didn't seem to eat anything different than we did or eat particularly anything more than we did at meals. The Haybacks don't know it, but their son is hiding a secret. Whenever he's away from them, he's compulsively eating throughout the day. That would, you know, buy extra lunches. And the bell would ring, and I'd be late to class because I'd be finishing up lunch. At times, I'd be the last one in the lunchroom. I never felt full. I just I ate, ate a meal, and so I was why more. The thought that kept going through my mind is he's not gaining this weight on what I give him. And I'd say, Connor, what are you doing? Where are you getting the food? Well, I don't know, Mom. I don't know. He was probably about 185 pounds at that point, which is really heavy. And he was probably four foot ten. I fell alone, didn't know what was going on. There was something inside me that was driving me, needed more food, and I just kept on eating just to satisfy that sensation I had. At 13 years old, Connor Hayback is 4 foot 10 and 185 pounds. Unbeknownst to his worried parents, his appetite is raging out of control, and he's secretly eating behind their backs. I just never felt full, so I just kept on eating. I kept myself. I was embarrassed. I wanted to tell my parents. We continued to struggle with an answer as to why Connor was gaining weight so rapidly. Utterly baffled by Connor's weight gain, the Haybacks take him to see his doctor. The pediatrician recommended that we consult with a dietitian, which we did, and she did look at him and then put him on a specific diet with reduced calories. We packed lunches with skim milk and a piece of fruit and carrots and celery and steamed vegetables. Although Connor follows the dietitian's plan at home, on his way to and from school, he can't seem to stop himself from using his allowance to buy extra meals. Well, I'd wake up, eat breakfast, and eat another breakfast, maybe bagel or whatever. Then lunch, on the way home, triple cheeseburger, fries, and a chocolate shake. I'd get home just in time for dinner. From our perspective, it didn't look like he was eating much more than normal because we only saw what he ate at home and we never suspected anything beyond that. It just got to a critical point where we needed to figure out what was going on. The pediatrician recognized this is a problem. There was some concern that he must be processing food differently or there's some, you know, endocrine disorder like thyroid disorder or something that resulted in, in, in him being so obese. So she recommended us go see an endocrinologist. An endocrinologist is a specialist that deals in the endocrine system, which is the hormone functions of the body, which regulate metabolism. I took Connor to his first appointment to see the adult endocrinologist. She weighed him and gave him a physical and uh, did some blood work to start to determine what was going on. But none of the tests show anything out of the ordinary. He really had no diagnosis at all, except that he's overweight. I was hoping that I would find the answer and we didn't get it and it was frustrating. We were pretty much at sea in terms of what was going on and, and scared and concerned and in a panic. I was really scared. I mean, you know, I drastically gaining weight and couldn't stop. I knew that was, this was not normal. We would have to buy clothes and larger size pants and larger size shirts at a, a rate where it was frightening. He was mercilessly teased. It's agonizing to see your child go through this, to see him suffer and not know the reason why. By that time, he was 15 and a half. He was up to 280 pounds. He was past being overweight. He was morbidly obese, and it became a great concern. But worried as they are, John and Sue have no idea just how dire the situation has become. Connor's secret eating seems to be growing more uncontrollable and bizarre by the moment. I would go from one restaurant and eat a meal and 
then go for another restaurant until I spent money that I had. And I go behind the restaurants and eat out of garbage. Behind fast food restaurants was the best place because I knew people not eat everything. People would walk by and look at me. It was, it was uncomfortable at times. But I I couldn't help it. I had a problem and didn't know how to ask for help. I could not control it. I was scared. Things just kind of snowballed out of control. I mean, it was critical. He had difficulty breathing, he had difficulty moving around. The simple things were difficult to do. It was difficult to go upstairs. We were desperate for answers. But at that point, we went back to our pediatrician and she recommended a pediatric endocrinologist. That same afternoon, they make an appointment with Dr. Deborah Edidin. History and physical examination remain the linchpins of diagnosis in pediatric endocrinology. So we spent a long time combing through Connors. The history raised red flags that this was not garden variety obesity. After giving Connor an exam and carefully reviewing his medical records, Dr. Edidin has a hunch. But in order to confirm it, she first has to run a blood test. The key test to perform at this juncture was a genetic test, which could be done on a sample of Connor's blood. When the results of the test came back, I called the hay box and asked them to come to the office to discuss our findings. Based on Connor's history, physical examination, and genetic evaluation, I diagnosed him to have Prader-Willi syndrome. Prader-Willi syndrome is a genetic disease that causes life-threatening obesity. In a healthy individual, a part of the brain called the hypothalamus regulates sensations of satiety and hunger. But in patients like Connor, for some unknown reason, the hypothalamus doesn't function properly, and the patient experiences an uncontrollable urge to eat. The bottom line in this condition is that he has no ability to control his appetite, to ever feel satisfied, which results in voracious appetite. It's not the hunger you and I feel when we missed a meal. It's a starving hunger. This is not a matter of willpower. It's a compulsion over which they have no control. I finally told my parents that I'd be eating extra meals or I'd forcing through the garbage for food. I feel bad for him. I, just how humiliating is that, that you're so hungry that you're going through garbage cans? It still amazes us sometimes that some of the things he did to get food and, and uh, you know, the amount of food he ate. I was happy relieved. I was, every, I, I, tears were, well, in my eyes, like... Finally, I finally I got the answer I was I've been looking for. We were relieved, of course, to get the diagnosis to actually know what it was, but then it's devastating. It's a complicated disorder. One of the many strange facets of the disease is that it's often accompanied by low muscle tone, hypotonia. Connor's first symptoms surfaced the day he was born, when the weak muscles in his mouth made it hard for him to nurse. The poor feeding is due to the hypotonia, these weak, floppy muscles. The same lack of muscle tone made it difficult for Connor to speak. The muscles in the, in the diaphragm and in the, in the mouth and the tongue, it's harder for Connor. Connor has about a third less muscle mass than a normal person. Ironically, although children with Prader Willi are often poor eaters as babies, they become uncontrollable overeaters once they get older. What turns this switch from having no interest in food to becoming obsessed with food in early childhood? That remains unclear. With a diagnosis finally in hand, Sue and John can't help but wonder why no one managed to put the pieces of the puzzle together sooner. While doctors see obesity every day in their offices, Prader-Willi syndrome is very rare. In the United States, the incidence is considered to be about 1 in 15,000 births. 
But the Haybacks know they're fortunate to have received the diagnosis when they did. Left untreated, the disease can be devastating, even fatal. Because of the amounts of food they eat, they can go on a forage that can actually result in a stomach rupture. The morbid obesity associated with Prader-Willi syndrome can result in heart attack, strokes, high blood pressure. We're very fortunate that we got through with him surviving without anything serious happening. Unfortunately, there is no cure or even a treatment for the disorder. There is nothing we know right now to do about the appetite. It does not seem to be sensitive to medications that other people might take to suppress their appetite, and we're just not sure why. Our hearts went out to Connor, you know, to know that this was not something we could correct. Going forward, what do we need to do to give Connor the best chance he can of, of you know, living the most productive and happy life he can? The typical solution is to institutionalize the individual with Prada Willis syndrome. We felt that this, that was not a solution for our family. The key to the success is the parent who is there 24-7 to monitor the weight, to lock the cupboards. This can be a very successful regimen uh, if the parents are able to be there for the, for the children. We had to lock all of our food away, which means we have a lock on a refrigerator. We took all the food out of our cabinets and we turned a closet into a pantry and we keep that locked. At night, we double lock our doors so Connor cannot leave the house to eat. You need to be hyper vigilant about food because individuals with Prada Willie syndrome, because of the drive, um, they're extremely creative at getting food and finding food. 24 7 supervision is the only thing that works. I can't do it myself. With intense vigilance and dedication, the Haybacks are able to keep their son's weight under control throughout high school. But once he graduates, they face a new problem. For him to go to college, he had to have somebody with him supervising him. So we decided that I would provide the vigilance. I would go with him and either sit outside the classroom or sit inside the classroom with him sometimes. He graduated from college with a bachelor's degree in political science. I'm thankful I couldn't have done it without my uh, loving and supporting family that I have. Today, Connor is 29 years old and living with his parents, who help him successfully manage his disease. Connor's at his ideal weight now for his height. He's 135 pounds. At one point, he was over 290 pounds, so he lost almost 160 pounds over a period of years. They changed their whole lives just to take care of me. I am really thankful. John is now the CEO of a nonprofit in downtown Chicago, and Connor works with him as a data analyst. I hope that what I've accomplished will give hope to other people who are dealing with what I'm dealing with. Connor's been a blessing for us. He always will be a blessing for us. As hard as it is to have a child who's different, who's disabled, it also brings out things in us that you never thought were going to be there. It's enriched our lives in ways that we hadn't you know, anticipated. You know, it's made us a, a, a better people, you know? <laughs> better people and a better family. It may not be the life you planned, but it can be a great life.